Hello, friends. This is your host, Prashant Daniel, and welcome to the Reasonable Truth Podcast, a program dedicated to helping Christians understand, articulate, and defend their faith as winsome ambassadors of Christ. It's good to be back with you guys again today, and I just want to make a quick plug for our upcoming Gravity Conference, uh, which will be happening on Saturday, September 30th at Sovereign Way Christian Church. If you're, inter if you're interested in registering, go on to our website, reasonabletruth.org, and you can register there. It's, uh, it's only $10 uh, early bird price, and um, after the 1st of August, it's going to go up to 20. So make sure to grab those tickets as quickly as possible. All right. Uh, I'm really excited for today's show. Uh, this is uh, this is actually an episode I've been wanting to do for almost two years. And um, the, the timing just hadn't worked out. But uh, here we are finally. I'm, I'm so glad to have on my former professor, Ken, Kenneth Samples. And uh, Kenneth Samples, uh, is an adjunct professor at Biola University, and I studied under him. He was my professor of logic and critical thinking and also uh, world religions, I believe. And um, But he's also a senior research scholar with Reasons to Believe, uh, incredible uh, organization based right there in California. Professor Samples, welcome to the show. Hello, Prashant. It's really good to see you, and uh, thank you for having me on your show. And that that conference you mentioned sounds exciting. It is, yeah. We're we're really looking forward to it. It's it's uh, our second one. We did one last year, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, we actually uh, had it at Biola itself, and so it was really um, it felt kind of surreal, I should say. Uh, especially for me, uh, having been having graduated from there, you know, I was a student there about yeah. 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. now here I was, you know, back at my old stomping grounds and actually as a speaker, uh, you know, getting to uh, talk to an audience over there. So that was a really surreal, but also very gratifying experience. And so, uh, yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm really excited to have you. You know, I, I should say, for those of you listening online, um, and I, I promise I'm not saying this to flatter or anything like that, but Professor Samples, uh, you were always one of my, maybe this sounds kind of cliche to say, my favorite professor. Okay, I'm just going to oh. say it. My favorite professor uh, at Biola University, uh, partly because of just your just your your winsomeness and the way you would balance out, uh, you know, very sharp critical thinking, but also with your graciousness. Uh, but also the topics you talked about were were things that were very, very close to my heart. I always enjoyed every class of yours that I sat in on. I just wanted to say that. I appreciate that very much. But, you know, let me return the favor. I've, <laughs> I've taught at Biola for many, many years, and you were one of the very best students. And in fact, Prashant, one of the things I appreciated most about you is uh, not only are you very, very bright, and there are a lot of bright students who come to Biola University, but you had a you struck a really good balance of of you know a sharp mind, but you had a warm, caring heart, and um, that's something I really do try to encourage, particularly in a in an academic setting where you know it's easy to to uh, a lot of students have very their analytical skills are very high, but then the moral virtues, we want to build that up. And you balance that really, really well. So I consider you one of the finest students that I had the privilege of teaching. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. Those are very, very kind words. I really appreciate it. That means a lot to me. Uh, yeah. And part of also what uh, made it very interesting for me to learn under you uh, was your influences, your your kind of background and story and things like that, which you have shared with us a few times uh, in class. And so I would love for our listeners to, to get a glimpse of that. So uh, if you can tell me just, you know, your personal story and how you came to become a professor at Biola and how you um, and how you ended up, uh, you know, be becoming a research scholar with reasons to believe and 
I, I want to spend more time later on your on the influences in your life um, separately, but just from a personal story point, just tell me how you got here. Yes, thank you for for asking. Um, you know, my my parents were evangelicals, and uh, uh, they lived in a West Virginia, which is a very rural state. But in the, in the mid fifties, they moved to California. And uh, in the early 60s, my parents converted to Roman Catholicism, which was quite a big step because they were probably never been to a church that had more than 100 people in it, but they became Catholic. And so I was baptized as a four-year-old at St. Athanasius's Catholic Church in Long Beach. And on the front of the door, of course, I couldn't, I couldn't pronounce or uh, spell Athanasius at the time. I was just a young boy. <laughs> But on the front door of the church, it says Athanasius Contramundum, which is a very powerful statement. Athanasius was the one defending, uh, you know, Nicene Christianity against the heresy of Arianism. Well, um, I grew up kind of Catholic, so in some ways kind of nominally Catholic. My my parents kind of, uh, you know, they, they, they kind of uh, weren't real sure where they wanted to end up in terms of their church. But I, uh, when I was about 20 years old, I really began to take my faith seriously. And uh, one of the books that had a huge influence, of course, was uh, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. That was, that was probably the first Christian book that I read. And it influenced me for a lot of reasons, Prashant. Um, not only getting kind of you know, basic or mere Christian doctrine, but just how careful Lewis was. That really, that really impressed me. And um, that, that book, along with certain other people that I encountered, led me to, you know, to pursue an undergraduate degree in history and philosophy, and then ultimately to take a, a master's degree in theology from Talbot School of Theology. And my first area of apologetic ministry was uh, in the area of, I guess in those days we would call it counter-cult apologetics. Walter Martin was one of my mentors. And uh, so I worked there uh, for seven years. Uh, when Walter passed away, a number of the scholars would do the program, The Bible Answer Man. And so I did that for a little while along with uh, some other people. And it was through that I met uh, Hugh Ross, of course, who is an astronomer and a Christian thinker. And uh, he was very early on in his organization called Reasons to Believe. So I was, uh, I left uh, uh, CRI, Christian Research Institute. I was teaching philosophy at a couple different colleges, uh, including Biola, uh, as a as really an adjunct or a part-time instructor. And um in the late 1990s, uh, Hugh invited me to come and uh, give consideration if I'd like to work with him. And so I was, uh, after him, I was the first person on the scholar team, which now has uh, six full-time scholars and uh, we have a scholar community. But I've worked at Reasons to Believe. I, I, I think uh, actually next month, it'll be 26 years that I've been there. Wow. I've probably taught at Biola as an adjunct for about 20 years as well. So those, that's a little bit about my story. And uh, I love teaching. I love writing. I love uh, hopefully influencing and maybe shaping, you know, young, young Christian minds like you, you were you and others there. I really I really thought, wow, um, you're going to have a big impact on the Lord's kingdom. And uh, I wanted to try to help in any way I could to uh, sharpen your thinking and encourage you. So, uh, yeah, uh, Biola is a Biola is a great school, and uh, you did you did extremely well when you were there. And I know you've done more education since then. I have, yeah. I, I look back fondly um, at my Biola days, and it was such a good time. I, I just learned so much when I was there. Uh, but I also think, I think you're right. I, I, I think of what you mentioned a little bit earlier about, you know, just um, when you're in a program, or maybe I should back up a little bit and say, even when, when we're in a field like apologetics, it can become very cerebral. It can become very, 
abstract. It, you know, very, it can become highly intellectual. And I think this was one of the reasons that attracted me to your class is you always did a very good job uh, kind of laying the breadcrumbs down to kind of help us connect the dots from not, not you would never leave us up there in the abstract clouds of all this intellectual stuff, but say, hey, what does this have to do with things right here on the ground? And uh, so that was one of the reasons uh, I and I, I can testify to so many of my other friends also who uh, who we really we really enjoyed your class so much for those reasons. I, I want to talk about um, um, the the actual people, the personalities mm -hmm. that that were major influences in your life. And I've seen over the years, obviously, you know, I've followed reasons to believe I, I frequently, when I say frequently, I mean, like maybe once in a few months or so, I'll come across uh, and read a lot of articles you've posted and things like that. So I know, um, I actually know exactly who the authors, the people are who have influenced you only because I've read so much of your work. <laughs> but I want you to to tell our listeners uh, for yourself exactly who those people were and how they shaped and influenced um, who you are today. Yes, uh, there's a couple of people that I could mention and uh, probably the most important person and kind of influencing me in terms of apologetics and ideas and uh, uh, taking the Christian worldview very seriously and being reflective uh, would be Walter Martin. Uh, Walter was uh, the original Bible Answer Man. Uh, he was just a, an amazing person, Prashant. He would do the Bible Answer Man program, answer questions for an hour every, every day, uh, every weekday. And uh, he'd be sitting in there in the studio with just his Bible. I mean, he didn't have, there was no internet in those days. Uh, he didn't have any other books. He just, his mind and scripture. And I attended his class for uh, a number of years. He taught at a, a Christian church in Southern California. And he had a Bible class at one point. I think there were like 700 people who came to his Bible class. And I would take notes, I had a yellow pad, I would ask questions, uh, I read his books, and he really motivated me. Um, you know, in becoming a Christian, I think I came to Christ uh, more out of a sense of need. That is, I realized, you know, I had been searching my whole life. I was kind of a restless soul. I was looking for meaning and purpose and significance. I wanted to discover truth, goodness, and beauty in life. And, um, you know, Walter, Walter was remarkable in his kind of ability because he was willing to engage various people who challenged the faith. I mean, he debated uh, top-notch atheists. He debated, you know, Mormon uh, thinkers, Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, he just had kind of an encyclopedic mind but he was also a very devout person. I mean, he was not, uh, I, I, I like your comment about the cerebral elements because, you know, I, I think it's very easy uh, for people like you and me where ideas come easy to us. That is, we feel comfortable in a world of ideas. You can forget that it's not just doing apologetics, defending the faith, answering questions, but doing it with gentleness. Uh, you know, doing it with respect. I talk about the golden rule of apologetics. And, you know, Walter taught me that, hey, when a, if a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, you need to talk with them, you need to share your faith with them, reason, reason through it. So Walter had a big influence. His personality uh, and his skill set was very different from mine. He was much bolder, um, I would call him the general Patton of Christian apologetics. I mean, he was <laughs> commanding, and uh, I was one of his privates or, or or lieutenants, and I followed him. But he had a he had a big influence on me, and he exposed me to various ideas. He encouraged me to write about Seventh Day Adventism, which became an area that I wrote uh, scholarly articles. He also had been Catholic himself, and so I wrote articles in the area of Roman Catholicism. And that really encouraged me, Prashant, to go to church history, uh, where uh, people like St. Augustine and um, people like Blaise Pascal and C.S. Lewis had 
had enduring influence on me. And I, I try to encourage my students to read, you know, the confessions and the pensées and mere Christianity. Another person that had a big influence on me uh, was a professor of philosophy at Cerritos College, which was a community college, uh, not too far from Biola, actually, just a, a couple miles. His name was Douglas Wessel, and he, uh, I, I loved being in his class, Prashanth, because even though he was a, a, a fairly conservative Lutheran Christian, when you were in class, you never knew what he believed. It was almost like whatever <laughs> philosopher he was talking about, he believed that. So he exposed me to Nietzsche and Immanuel Kant and Jean-Paul Sartre. And I was always puzzled. Wow, how, you know, he, he was teaching us to think. He wasn't telling us what to think. He was teaching us how to think. And I loved it because right. uh, it exposed me to, uh, you know, he, he was my first teacher in world religion. So what I knew about Hinduism, what I learned about Islam what I knew about Christianity and Judaism, I learned first from him. So he, he, he taught me that you really need to be a fair-minded, fair person. And uh, that, that really stayed with me. Uh, another influence in my life was John Warwick Montgomery, who is a really kind of a legendary Christian apologist. I think I, think I read at some point that Dr. Montgomery had 11 earned degrees. He had written over 40 books. And uh, at the time, he had started a school in Southern California called Simon Greenleaf School of Law, where you could study law and apologetics. Well, I would go and listen to some of his lectures. And it was John Montgomery that first, I first heard the expression, the life of the mind and being a Renaissance Christian. And mm. uh, it had a powerful powerful, enduring influence. That's something, you know, I, I'm thinking I first heard a lecture by him probably in 1982. So, you know, what is that? 40 years uh, ago. And maybe another person I could, I could mention that had a big influence. I was a student at Concordia University as an undergraduate. This is uh, one of the colleges that the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate has. And they call all of their colleges now Concordia, but this was in Irvine in Southern California. And I had a couple Lutheran uh, scholars there. Um, Robert Holst, Dr. Robert Holst had studied at Princeton University uh, under Bruce Metzger, and he was just brilliant on Greek and Hebrew and Latin and German and French. And I thought, man, what kind of mind does he have? But you know, I was so impressed with Dr. Hulse uh, Prashanth because not only was one of, one of the most linguistically careful people I'd have encountered, but he was also very caring, uh, very passionate. He taught me, I remember him taking me aside at one point. He said, Kenny, he goes, I, I know you're going to do really well in your academic career, but I want to make sure that you can speak to the common person. I want to make sure that you you think about people who, you know, are on the margins of society. And, uh, you know, I never had anybody talk to me about the importance of, of you know, thinking about justice, thinking about uh, wisdom. And I had other professors there, um, Professor Dargetz uh, and Professor Schramm. So they really influenced me and got me to read Luther and to study the Reformation. So those are some of the people that have shaped me. And, uh, you know, whenever any of those individuals have died, Walter and um, Professor Schramm, and, and of course, I had, I had uh, other influences, Michael Green, who I know you know, he influenced me. And uh, he wrote an endorsement of my book, Classic Christian Thinkers. And Krishant, he told me the next day he was going to have heart surgery. And I thought, oh, I thought, Professor Green, you don't need to write anything for me. He goes, no, wow. I got to get this done before I, before I go to the doctor tomorrow, the hospital. And when he passed away, I wrote, uh, you know, about him and about how he influenced me. And I've written articles about Walter Martin and uh, Martin Schramm. So those are some of the people uh, and some of their characteristics that have had an enduring influence on me. And I really feel, I really think 
that uh, I owe them a debt of gratitude. They, they spent time with me and helped me, nurtured me as mentors. Yeah, no, that, that's incredible. Uh, there's a lot of big names you've mentioned over there. And, you know, the first time I listened to Dr. Martin, I was just, I was just blown away. And I was like, oh, I wish I could have been there back then. He's such a prolific speaker. And I really think that God gave him a gift of boldness that I had never oh, heard cool. from anywhere else. Like, even when he spoke to, uh, like, when he did debates with Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, and I remember this one uh, time when um, I forget what I it was a TBN or one of that you know the charismatic Pentecostal channels sure. had him on there as a guest and boy did they regret having him on I mean they, they didn't come out and say that but just from their expressions he was just so bold but he was never rude he was never arrogant yep. but he was bold as a lion and so that's one of the things I really appreciated about him and yeah I agree his book uh, Kingdom of the Cults is I think the platinum standard for uh, you know treatments on the cults and engaging with the cults and all that and I I've, I've used the book personally myself whenever I've taught on it uh, even today I, I tell a lot of people you want to study anything about the cults go get your hands on that book that's the resource yeah. for you. I'll uh, tell you a, a funny story when uh, sure. I was dating uh, Joan who became my wife and she would come to Martin's class. We were just, uh, we had just kind of uh, began dating. And I remember uh, Walter would be on the Bible Answer Man on Saturday night at, at nine o'clock. So we'd go out and I'd say, we have to go home because I've got to listen to Walter Martin. And <laughs> I knew she was the girl for me because she, she, she would listen to Martin with me. And, uh, you know, but we had to be, we had to come back home because I had to hear Walter Martin. That's right. That's 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 <laughs> awesome. Uh, there's another place uh, somewhere. It's one of your uh, articles. Uh, I forget where I read it, but I read that um, you had been gifted uh, mere Christianity by your sister, I think, if I remember correctly, a long yeah. time ago, obviously. And I remember instantly turning to my wife and saying, that's that's my story, too, because my wife gifted me mere Christianity. Wow a long time ago in my early 20s and just about the time when I was really starting to get interested in, you know, just the rationality of the Christian faith and apologetics and all that. And uh, my wife, well, at the time, you know, we were, you know, she was, uh, she was just a friend at the time. Yeah. Uh, we started dating, you know, much later, but uh, she, she gifted me that book and it, it just opened up a world for me. So in that way, I felt like kind of both of our stories were similar in that sense that someone close to us gifted us a book that just transformed the way we thought about things. You know, it's funny, C.S. Lewis, he, he has such a, I have so much respect for him. And I, you know, that book, I, I read it a number of times, but now I even try to go back once a year and review it because it means so much to me. And, you know, I never had a chance to meet him, but, um, you know, he has just had such an enduring influence. And uh, I, I think that's, I think that's great that both you and I began, you know, with, with mere Christianity, just a remarkable book. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So speaking of the life of the mind, I, I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. Um, you know, we've talked so much about the importance of thinking correctly. This is something that you taught all the time in class, you know, even in your logic and critical thinking class, you you uh, exhorted us to always make sure that it's not enough to just think of weighty things or heavy things, but to think correctly about weighty things and heavy things. And so speaking of that, uh, it it's easy to look around us. It's easy to look at the culture around us and think what in the world is happening. To yeah. me, uh, Professor Samples, it almost seems like the culture has lost its ability to think. Um, and so a question I want to put to you is how how is it that a nation like ours and, I, and I'm not you know, I, I don't want this to necessarily be political. That's not my point. But yeah. the question I'm asking is, how how did a nation like ours, which is which has such a strong Judeo-Christian framework and foundation uh, of intellectuality, get to this place today where people just don't know how to think anymore? And a lot of the problems in, in our society and culture we're seeing today are just, it's written with fallacies. It's written with yeah. uh, just erroneous thinking. Speak to that a little bit, will you? 
Yeah, well, I completely agree with you. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm I puzzled and baffled that we would have people uh, in America at some of our leading universities who wouldn't teach their students how to think, but they tell them what to believe. You know, we, we have kind of propaganda that comes at us in, in various ways. And, you know, in the New Testament, um, of course, the New Testament talks a great deal about the way you should live your life, moral virtues. You want to be faithful to your spouse. Um, you want to tell the truth. You don't want to steal. But there's also intellectual virtues, Prashant, that are in the New Testament. I mean, uh, you know, in the book of Acts, we're told that the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians. Why? Because they heard Paul, but then they they were looking at the Old Testament. They were looking at the Hebrew scriptures and checking, is that really what, what it says? And I thought, wow, checking sources, being careful. Uh, Paul, the apostle, also talks about other intellectual virtues, like putting things to the test, you know, you know, uh, test all things, hold on to the truth. That was one of Walter Martin's passages he would bring us back to. And even the Apostle John uh, in his first epistle, chapter four, talks about, you know, don't believe things too easily or too quickly, but test the spirits, be discerning. So that idea of, uh, you know, uh, being careful, being thoughtful, uh, being able to you know, identify when an argument is a, is a good argument, it's valid, it's sound, or maybe they're in formal logical fallacies, you know, circular reasoning, ad hominem, straw man, and looking at biases that, you know, all of us are given to biases. There's confirmation bias. There's various forms of bias. And I'm I'm very puzzled how quickly I think our nation has come to a place where in, in its elite universities, um, it's, it seems more like propaganda where people have adopted maybe a postmodern perspective, very skeptical perspective. You can't, you know, you can't know the truth or it's more about power than it is truth. And I think, uh, Prashant, um, the antidote to propaganda is a good education. Right. And a good education is a critical education. It's it's teaching students to develop their own independent thinking. And I don't want anybody to become a Christian unless they think Christianity is true, That's unless right. they think it's reasonable and, and they should embrace it. So I, I think we're living at a very challenging time. And I love America. I mean, my, my father was a soldier in the Second World War. I have distant relatives who, who fought on both sides of the Civil War. Uh, West Virginia coming out of the Civil War. I, I love our nation. I'm very proud of its history. Um, but it, it seems that we are living at a time where, uh, you know, truth, goodness, and beauty are not the way people look at the world. They might look at it through, you know, race, gender, and class. And those are important issues. We should take them seriously. But I think the only way we can is if we're very careful in our thinking. And, you know, learn what an argument is where you you make a claim, the conclusion, and you support it with premises. Uh, and you draw, you're able to say, look, these premises infer. Uh, I can draw an inference here. Um, I would never, I mean, I, I certainly want to persuade people of the truth of Christianity, but I want them to examine the arguments and be able to look at them. And so when I teach uh I try to teach my students how to think. I don't tell them the conclusion they should draw. So right. I'm with you. And I, I think I think people need to be very discerning and very careful in their thinking. Fallacies, informal logical fallacies are very important, Prashant, because you, you get to see how arguments break down and uh, how people can be persuaded by arguments that are that are, that are not. Uh, adequate because uh, you know they have defects, and right. um, I, I, I love teaching logic because of all the classes I've taught over more than well, I, I think I've been teaching college and university courses since 1990, uh, so it's more than 30 years. The class that most students come to me 
and, and this would include both Christian and non-Christian students, they would come to me, Prashanth, and they'd say, you know, when I took your logic class. I, I feel like I learned a skill I never had before. I feel empowered. I feel yeah. like I can like take arguments apart and put them together. And I, I'm just so pleased when I hear that. So yes, yeah. I mean, logic is such a Im- critical tool and our culture needs it desperately today. I completely agree. Um, you know, I, I know that America went through a very tumultuous time back in the 60s and 70s. I think a lot of things that shaped us, uh, the, some of the tectonic cultural shifts that happened back during that time uh, were almost irreversible. We're still seeing the effects of that today. But when I just look at even like the last 20 years, it seems, it almost feels like never have I ever seen before such a battle over ideas. And, um, you know, I was last year sometime, early last year, I was reading uh, the philosopher Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher. Yeah. And, you know, he he talks about um, the, the mimetic world and the poetic world, right? And he makes this difference between, we. It, so we used to live in a world where we were part of a bigger world and and we were thinking about how do we fit into that world and uh, you know even he uses the analogy of like farmers and uh, you know how uh, we were dependent on the crops we I mean with the weather and we were dependent on all these other things but the world has changed and we now live in a poetic world where we have become the masters of the universe and we can you know, control how to irrigate the crops and all these kind of things. Carl Truman right. talked about this in his book, uh, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self as well. And uh, so it is interesting how, and you, we can trace probably some of this back to the Enlightenment, post-Enlightenment ideas and things like that. But one of the things I see in our culture today is just the elevation of the narrative over objective truth. It seems like data and facts and evidence doesn't seem to matter anymore. I've actually been baffled over the last few years where, you know, I've seen certain debates or I'm listening to certain talks or something like that. And I see thinkers, conservative thinkers offer a rational, objective evidence and data, and it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, What ultimately seems to matter is the narrative. And so, uh, you know, there are days when I wake up and I feel uh, I feel skeptical. I feel, you know, like, man, I, I don't know how we're going to recover from this. And then there are other, other days that I'm still hopeful. So really quick here, before we go into our break, can you offer maybe, I, I don't know if there's any silver bullet to this problem, but can you offer, what would that look like? What would a solution look like to kind of turn the clock back, if you will, maybe, or to to encourage critical thinking? Where does it start? Does it begin in academia? Does it begin in the church? What do you think? How do we encourage people to think critically? And how how do we get the culture to think more critically again? Yeah, and I I share with you, I mean, I I have to say the last decade or so, I've become a bit pessimistic. But of course, my studies in Christian history help because you know, there have been times in the past where Christianity was seemed like it was winning the world, and then other times where it seemed very weak and pathetic. That's right. I mean, yeah. when St. Augustine died, he thought Roman civilization, he thought civilization itself was coming apart. Uh, but Christianity, you know, was able to work through that. I completely agree with you. I, I, I'm baffled when, you know, I, I was talking to a person one day, and I said, uh, I said, you know, I, I disagree with your lifestyle. Uh, this this was a person who believed that he could have sex with many women or others that, that he wanted. And I said, you know, I, I I strongly disagree with your lifestyle, but I I respect you as a, as a human being. And I I think we now live at a time where, you know, to to disagree with someone is that you hate them. Um, that and and I I I think we have to kind of begin on a lot of different levels. You know, uh, uh, Pelican, uh, Yaroslav Pelican, who was a, a great historian of Christianity at Yale for like 40 years, Pelican had a great quote in one of his uh, Christian history. He says, the church is always more than a school, but it can't be less than a school. Right. And, and he's right, I think, that a church is always more than a school. It's it's a place of worship. It's a place of fellowship. It's it's a hospital. It 
might be an athletic uh, event. It, the church is a many splintered thing, but it can't be less than a, than a school. And I, I think that our churches, and I, if I could speak, our evangelical churches, I think they have become less than schools. And right. I think we need to come back to that and, you know, teach people how to think, how to read scripture, how to think through it. I certainly think uh, we need other areas, uh, you know, in, in the academic field. But, you know, the church can be a powerful force, but it can also be, it can be very weak. And I I would like to encourage pastors and teachers to to value reason, logic, and rationality. Yeah, I agree. One of the things we care about deeply, even here at Reasonable Truth, is bridging academia and the church, because we really believe that, you know, uh, the, the church needs the, the expertise of academia, but academia needs the moral foundations of the church. And so yeah. there needs to be this sort of symbiotic relationship between the two. I also think I, it, it also makes me wonder if the internet and sort of the the democratization of information, if you will, has really changed the landscape because, and there's positives and negatives. You know, it used to be that a lot of bad ideas that came out of academia were kind of siloed off. They stayed in academia. And that's not the case today. Today, a lot of those bad ideas are <clears throat> finding their ways onto the streets. And uh, you see you know, popular level arguments on the streets that sound very, very technical, and you kind of trace it back and it goes back to academia. And so, yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, from a Christian perspective, a lot of it needs to begin in the church. And uh, I think you're right. Um, some of my concern with certain Christian subcultures has been precisely that, is that we're not talking about the rich Christian history. We're not talking about church history. We're not talking about systematic theology. We're not addressing apologetics. And, you know, we're not thinking critically and having our finger on the pulse of the culture. And so um, we're, we're doing other things. You know, we're talking about the, the importance of experiencing God and, you know, all those kind of things. And all those things are good, but we need both. And so um, if, if we don't do that, if, if the Christian church, and, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not you know, I don't want people who are listening online to think that I'm beating up the church. I, I love the church. The church is God's beautiful gift to us. It is a the wonderful institution of, you know, that God has given us. But it's because I love the church so much that I'm frustrated with the church sometimes. Yeah, is course. that where is the church, you know, help? And what is, I think, speaking of Dr. Walter Martin, the great, late, great Dr. Walter Martin would always say, the cults are the unpaid bills of the church, right? I wow. believe he used to yeah. say that. He did. And so yeah. uh, part of the reason that the, these cults even came out was because maybe there were areas where the church simply did not pay attention to. And so, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, yeah, yes. Yeah, just, I mean, if you had any concluding thoughts on that, we have about a couple of minutes here before we go into the break. But um, what, what yeah. does that look like in the church? How would you encourage a church to get back to critical thinking? Yeah, I think that um, I think that there are some very hopeful things that can be done. You know, if if the, if the pastors of our churches, if they start introducing critical thinking, you know, if they, you know, in their sermon, they might talk about, hey, well, look at Paul here. He's he's testing these things. Paul talks about intellectual virtues, not you know moral virtues and intellectual virtues. Uh, I think even bringing people, scholars like yourself and other people, come in and give a, a talk in the area, you know, and say, wow, look, this this guy is looking at political issues. He's looking at philosophical issues, scientific issues. I, I think, too, that, uh, you know, helping people to feel comfortable with the Bible, uh, how how to it's it's basic themes, how to read it, how to understand it. You know, evangelicals are good at Bible study, but you, you need to be able to critique, well, what in the heck is postmodernism? What is moral relativism? What is relativistic truth claims? You know, doing right. some apologetics, doing teaching a little logic and philosophy uh, can be remarkably helpful. I mean, you're right, Prashant. I mean, in many ways, it was the Christian worldview that birthed science in the 
right. you know, the 1600s. Uh, Christianity has birthed many. Some of the absolute great logicians have been Christians. But the church can also be, it has its challenges. And uh, I, I think you're exactly right. And I, I'm not, you know, you could put Siddhartha Gautama, you could put Socrates, you could put Cicero, uh, and even the Bible. They all say that we are what we think. We are what we think as a man thinketh. And uh, well, if that's right, and so many people agree, then we need to be about helping people to know how to think clearly, carefully, reflectively, uh, even handedly. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and I want to discuss all of that uh, when we uh, get back. We're going to have to take a little break here. So I have a lot more that I want to discuss with you. But before we do that, let's take a quick break and we will be right back. Stay tuned. All right, friends, welcome back to the Reasonable Truth Podcast. I'm talking to uh, Professor Kenneth Samples. And uh, before the break, we were talking about a lot of uh, interesting things. We talked about just the influences uh, in his personal life, uh, how he came to become a professor and a research scholar with reasons to believe. And we've talked about just the importance of the life of the mind and how important it is to think critically. And uh, we ended this segment on how we see some of that lacking uh, in the culture. Uh, and so now in the second segment, I want to talk about uh, things from a more biblical Christian perspective. And I want to I, I want to talk about the Christian church and how we can uh, address things. If there's any house cleaning that we need to do on our own end, because as you said, uh, Professor Samples, that the, the Christian church has been crucial uh, to um, not only to the world in general, but especially to to Western philosophy, to the to the Western world, and so I think it is important that we we talk about the church. Um, and one of the questions I want to ask is, you know, we've talked about the waning of the life of the mind in the culture, yeah. and I suppose maybe a good segue is to ask, well, is is the life of the mind waning in the Christian church itself? We briefly talked about it before the break, but I want to get a little deeper in there because uh, I think it's important for, for Christians to hear. Uh, there has been some criticism in the last, oh, I don't know, maybe like 15, 20 years or so, uh, that the church is becoming um, very emotional, very deeply you know, what's the word? Esoteric, very sensitive. I don't like to use the word feminized. I've heard some people say that uh, yeah. because um, I actually think that uh, there are a lot of incredible, very thoughtful, um, you know, women out there. My wife herself is a very, you know, rational, logical person. So I don't yeah. like to use that word. But um, first of all, is it true? Do you think that um, do you think that the life of the mind is waning in the Christian church because we're we've become very feelings oriented? And uh, if so, uh, what do we do about that uh, criticism? Yes, I, I think it has. I mean, I, I think uh, I think of Mark Knoll's book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. I think that came about came out about 1990. So it's been out of ways. Um, you know, one of my friends and colleagues uh, at, at Talbot, um, J.P. Moreland, wrote a book, Loving God with All of Your Mind. But one of the things that Mark Knoll says is that, in some respects, um, there isn't much of an evangelical mind. Mm -hmm. And you know, he, he said, "Look, in 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 history, Christianity has had some of the greatest thinkers." Um, and and I, I think it's right, and I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not. My intention is not to run down or to find fault with our churches. Look, pastors have challenging issues to deal with. You know, Christians are forgiven sinners. We have our faults and our difficulties. And so churches do a lot of very, very good things. But I, I think clearly um, there are a lot of intellectual people that I have met in my 30 or 40 years of doing apologetics. And Prashant, they will tell me, they, they'll say to me, I don't feel like I fit in at my church. Um, it, it seems more... Uh, it seems more like there is a, an emotional element, 
which is fine, but you know they're not interested in kind of looking at doctrine or looking at ideas. And so there, I think there is a, a bit of a crisis in the evangelical church where, where intellectuals feel like, wow, I, I'm, I'm not being challenged. You know, I want to I wanna really be intellectually challenged by my faith, but the church seems more interested in, in you know, areas of, of emotion and things of that nature. And again, I, I, I don't want to have a false dichotomy. I, I think Christian people should love God with their mind, but they should love him with their heart and their compassion. Uh, so we don't want to downplay that. But I have met lots of people who, uh, you know, they say, I, I just feel like as an intellectual, I don't feel like I fit in. And, and here's the irony, I think, Prashant. Um, in evangelicalism, young people are leaving the church in groves. And, and a very yes. important part of it is they feel like, uh, you know, the world out there or the skeptical world out there, they have answers, but our church doesn't have. So it, it seems yeah. ironic that intellectuals sometimes feel uncomfortable in the evangelical church because those intellectuals need to be there to help these young people who are, who are struggling with truth questions. So right. I think it's a, uh, I think it's at a crisis level. I wrote an article on uh, this topic of you know intellectuals in the evangelical church. I got more responses on social media than any article I've ever written. I had people contacting mm -hmm. me and saying, you know, yeah, I I I feel like a dinosaur because I wanna I wanna read church history or I wanna read science and. Uh, I think the church is absolutely critical. I love your quote from Walter Martin, you know, the cults are the unpaid bills of the church. When the church doesn't do well, there are certain things that start showing up as kind of a cause and effect relationship. And, um, you know, I, I want to convey to people that Christianity has a deep intellectual tradition. Uh, it also has a, a very deep compassion uh, Christianity changed the world by building hospitals and soup kitchens and, you know, uh, developing the arts and all of these kinds of things and caring about people who were on the margin. I mean, the two largest people group to join Christianity in, you know, its first and second century were slaves and women who had very little or no rights at all in the Roman Empire. So being people of compassion and care, but we also have to be people who care about ideas. And um, yeah, that, you know, I, that's one of the reasons I'm a big supporter of your organization and of you, because I know you care about both. You're, you are a thinker and a feeler. That is, you have compassion, but you care about ideas. And that's such a dynamic uh, reality when when you bring both of them together. I, I don't want an intellectual who is super bright, but is, you know, uh, in it doesn't really express kind of care and, and thoughtfulness. Uh, and so we need both, not one or the other. That's right. Yeah. I, I it, you know, as you were talking, it reminded me of a conversation I um, had a long time ago. I was I was having this talk with uh, an elder at a church and uh, he mentioned something about, he said, you know, whenever people come to talk to me with, you know, struggles that they have about things that are happening in the culture and all that, I always tell them, don't pay attention to the culture, don't read non-Christian books, just keep your nose in the Bible, that's all you need, you don't need anything else. And, you know, even as he was saying that, I, I remember just in my mind kind of shaking my head thinking, yeah, maybe that's the problem. <laughs> you know, maybe that's the problem is, is why, you know, Christianity is becoming irrelevant, because if we kind of go off into our own bubble, um, uh, you know, not to mention Christians are not immune from confirmation bias either. And yeah. so we have to be careful. We have to have our finger on the pulse of culture. And, you know, it used to be back several decades ago that, uh, culture was downstream from theology, that what we believed in the faith we had informed uh, things that played out in the culture. And I feel like today it's the other way around. Theology is downstream from culture. Um, and so when I talk to a lot of even, you know, self, 
professed Christian, like young people, teenagers, they're not interested about Christology. They're not interested about the doctrine of the atonement. They're not interested about the old rugged cross. They want to know how does Christianity speak to my friend who is struggling with same-sex attraction? If Christianity is able to speak to her issue, then I'm interested in what Christianity has to say in general. Uh, speak to that a little bit. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I'm I'm in complete agreement. I think that, um, you know, I, I think when you think about Christianity, I mean, I think about some of the unique features of Christianity, the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, I think of the doctrine of the incarnation. I think of the atonement, the resurrection. I think of the Christian worldview, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. I think we live at a time, however, where there are many people, they're not asking uh, truth, goodness, and beauty. In fact, I'd put it this way. I think that when I first started in apologetics, again, about the late 80s, when I would go to the university, Prashant, and give a talk, I got almost all truth questions. Does God exist? Are there good arguments for his existence? Is right. Jesus the son of God? Um, how do I evaluate evidence for the resurrection? Uh, but I noticed about, uh, so that, that was like the late 80s, early 90s. I noticed about 15 years ago when I would go to the university with our reasons to believe, I, I, did, I got very few truth questions. I got questions like, well, ha, is Christianity good? Not whether Christianity is true, whether it's good. Has Christianity been good for women? Has Christianity been good for racial minorities? I got lots of questions like, wow, the God of the Old Testament seems fundamentally different than Jesus. And, and right. a light bulb went on. I thought, wow. So in apologetics, I can no longer just focus on the truth questions. I have to think myself, how do I make Christianity, how do I show people uh, that Christianity is relevant for their issues? How can I show them the good things? You know, I, I think about Tom Holland, the, um, you know, the skeptical historian who studied through church history. He loved the Roman Empire and he came to the conclusion, you know, my ethics, they're not Roman. My ethics are Christian. And, you know, Christianity is the one that helped develop education. Christianity is what preserved learning. Christianity says everybody has dignity and value because they're made in the image of God. Um, you know, science was birthed out of a, a, a Christian uh, Middle Ages. I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the reasons by my last book, I entitled it Christianity Cross-Examined. Is it, is it rational, relevant, and good? And so right. I think we're getting a completely different set of questions now. I remember Tim Keller, the uh, very thoughtful Presbyterian pastor as a large church in New York City. Keller said one day, and I, I thought it was interesting, he said that in his experience, you have to want Christianity to be true before you can actually come to believe that it's true. And so I thought, wow, I do need to talk to people about the good elements of the faith and that, yeah, there are dark sides. Yes, there's anti-intellectualism in the church. Christian people are fallen, forgiven sinners. You know, people get burned in their churches. And I, I have to communicate to them, Prashant, that, look, um, yeah, Christian people will let you down. Uh, I'll let you down. But Jesus won't. Jesus Christ won't. And right. it is it is he and his beliefs and values that has changed Western civilization for the good. So yeah, right. 30 years ago, truth questions. Now, a lot more about, I don't even know if Christianity is relevant. I don't even know if Christianity is good. I think that stretches us as apologists. We have to be able to field questions in, in a number of areas. No, that's right. That's exactly right. In fact, you almost, you actually took the words right out of my mouth. It's, you know, when you talked about the importance of Christianity being good, that's in fact, one of my very common mottos, even I, I say all the time that this culture 
uh, doesn't care as much about whether Christianity is true as much as whether it's good. And so, um, yeah, you know, it's interesting you talk about some of the questions that you used to deal with. And you've been doing this a lot longer than I have. And even in my lifetime, I it seems like the questions have changed. When I first started in apologetics, what, like maybe 15, 17 years ago, uh, there was still a lot of the there was still a lot of interest in the classical questions, yeah. like uh, you know what are the evidences for God? You know what are the uh, how do we know that the that the New Testament is reliable? And wh what are the evidences for the resurrection of Jesus? Those are a lot of the classical questions that we dealt with, and even just within my short time in doing apologetics, the questions are completely different now. Now yeah. it's what is a woman? And, you know, what yeah. is, uh, yeah. you know, uh, how, why why does it matter that, you know, why should, why does same-sex marriage matter? And just those are the questions that seem to be burning uh, these days. A lot of it has to do with, you know, with sexual identity and your personal identity and those kinds of issues. So, yeah, I agree. It, it seems that uh, the culture does want to know uh, whether Christianity has anything good to offer from a moral perspective, not necessarily from from a from a truth perspective, um, so given that given that that's the case, um, I agree with you. I think that apologists need to maybe change our methodology. It's not so much that um, we shouldn't talk about all the other things, like you know why does God allow evil and stuff like that. I'm sure that those questions are still there, but um, what are you know um, maybe I've asked this before, but what are some questions that churches need to start asking today um, in terms of uh, training people or in terms of resources that we would point them toward? I mean, obviously, um, a lot of stuff that we're hearing at church today, like you said, may seem irrelevant, maybe uh, not to, not to the Christian per se, but uh, to the world. Um, and so I remember actually when I was teaching an apologetics course at a church, there were numerous people who who would sit in on my class and I did, you know, teachings on the doctrine of hell. And I talked about uh, worldviews, naturalism, pantheism. We talked about, uh, you know, the abortion issue and all that. And I, I can't tell you, Professor Samples, the number of people who would come up to me after class and say, I've never heard any of this stuff before. Wow. I've never heard any of this stuff before. Why aren't we talking about this from the pulpit? And yeah. uh, a small part of me was is, was very gratified to hear that um, that you know I was able to share something that they found very novel. But at the same time, it was also discouraging. It was also sobering because I'm thinking to myself, this should not be a novel issue. This should not be a uh, it's something that they have never heard before. We should be teaching these things from the pulpit. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, you know, again, I, th I think that the classical Christian perspective is you look through the prism of truth, goodness, and beauty. Again, today, I, th I, th I think that has been set aside, and, and now it's race, gender, and class. Now, of course, Christianity has a lot to say. I, I think it was the belief in the Imago Dei that ultimately led uh, Britain and America to, to move away from slavery and the dignity of women. Um, I mean, Jesus treats women fundamentally different than the way other uh, world religious leaders or culture did. You know, in, in that kind of context, um, in talking about truth, goodness, and beauty, I mean, I have I know people and they'll tell me, you know, Professor Samples, I don't know that you can even know the truth. And with goodness, it seems like it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, but, you know, a lot of these same people that are relativistic in truth and goodness, when I talk about beauty, they're like, whoa, I, I won't go to church with you, but I'll, if you're going to take a, you know, a bunch of students to a, an art life, a, a museum, I'll go with you. I, I wonder if we don't talk need to talk more about beauty we need to talk and then maybe circle back to the truth right you know yeah. i mean here is here is this beauty that we all agree in beauty in literature uh beauty in music and all of these various fields 
uh, maybe we need to lay that out there and say, you know, here, here is a Christian perspective uh, on on beauty. Um, and I, and I think broadly to your your question as well. Uh, I mean, it's shocking. You hear you give a talk about uh, you know the, the the challenges of the problem of evil. You talk about hell. You talk about kind of fundamental, basic Christian ideas, and people come and say, you know, I, I haven't heard that before. Right. Uh, we have to be talking about the classical Christian worldview. What is our view of, you know, a, a worldview is how we make sense of reality, how we make sense of the world. It's made up of a cluster of beliefs, your view of God, your view of the world, your view of knowledge, your view of values, ethics, uh, art. Um, you know, Christianity has a unique way. Uh, we have a way of understanding the world, and it's through a God who created. Then there was a radical fall when human beings rebelled against God, and that that has affected the very nature of human beings, and it's affected the world. Then Christ, I mean, I, I remember Pac, J. I. Packer, the great a Presbyterian theologian, Ang actually I call him an Anglican theologian. Packer said, "You know, uh, of all of the, of all the myths, none of them can even compare with the truth of Christianity that God became man." All right. And I, I, I just when I heard that, I was like, "He's absolutely right." I mean, we believe that God has actually come into the world. Jesus was a single person with both a divine and human nature. Uh, I remember one of the Apollo astronauts when I was a boy, uh, Irwin, he said, you know, it's a great thing uh, for a man to walk on the moon, and he had, but he says it's a greater thing for God to walk the earth. And I thought, whoa. So, you know, these great truths um, of, again, the Trinity, the incarnation, the atonement, the resurrection, the second coming, kind of what, what C.S. Lewis would call mere Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to we need to be able to address these issues of gender. We need to be able to address these issues of race and class, but not uh, at the expense of all of these truth questions. And so, again, my latest book, Christianity Cross Examined, the first six chapters answer truth questions. The second six answer questions about has Christianity been good? And so. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to do both and, and right. it's amazing that somebody would think, well, I just don't think Christianity is even relevant. Wow. You, I, I want to be able to, you know, recommend sources that they can read. But yeah, that's kind of a little of my thinking on the topic. Right. And no, even as you were, so something you said really stood out to me, you talked about maybe instead of going straight to the room of truth maybe we need to open maybe we need to open the door to beauty to let them to eventually let them into the room of truth and i think i think that's very important because it reminds me of uh, it reminds me of something that i think alistair mcgrath said in his book uh, mere apologetics i think he i think that's the name of the book um and he he says somewhere in that but i i have to paraphrase it now but he basically says that Maybe it's time for us to start thinking that thinking about the fact that um, the beauty of the rationality of the Christian faith and you know reasonable apologetics in that sense is not effective anymore because reason itself is not valued anymore. And so maybe apologetics needs to have a more aesthetic appeal. Uh, or he says something to that effect yeah, that yes. maybe we have to, which is basically what you're saying. And so if that's the case, do you think that maybe it's, is it a communication issue? I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, at least from my understanding, it's not an issue of what we're going to talk about. It's not the content. Um, I've actually heard a few people uh, say, yeah, when I hear about these doctrines, they just sound raw, they sound cold, they sound rigid and kind of cardboardy, you know, just no personality at all. And yet when I see, when I read the Gospels, there's like this multifaceted, very nuanced, complex, beautiful, aesthetic aspect of Jesus that I find really appealing. And so um, 
it, you think we're missing something there? Maybe do we do we just need to become better communicators? Because it doesn't seem to me that it's an issue of the content as much as the way we communicate, as you said, from a from a vantage point of beauty. How do we make the gospel look beautiful? How do we make apologetics look aesthetically appealing? Uh, you know, I could see someone pushing back and saying, well, you know, we don't need to make anything aesthetically appealing to, to sinners and pagans because it's the truth. They have to take it or leave it. Well, see, that that approach itself sounds rigid and cold and raw. Yeah. And yeah. so I don't know. What do you think? Well, I, I think when you, you talk about truth, goodness and beauty, um, you know, I think we live at a time where, again, people have adopted a very postmodern perspective. They they think truth, you know, nobody nobody can know the truth. It's just a power game that, you know, that the majority use to to manipulate the minority. Or, you know, who can really know what is the right lifestyle to be lived? But again, this this element of beauty of, I was in England a few years ago and went to some of the uh, great cathedrals in England. I was just stunned by the beauty of these churches, the art, yes. the ideas. Well, I'm not saying in any way we don't, uh, we let go of truth and goodness. What I'm proposing is maybe we can lead with beauty and then circle back to truth and goodness. Yeah. And, you know, we have, we have lots of people who their lives are deeply dependent upon the aesthetic. Um, you know, they love movies. They love, you know, the, to go to a play. They, that's that's something that you know they they deeply care about these kind of aesthetic elements i think maybe bringing them back and saying look christianity has a lot to say about truth and goodness but it also has a lot to say about these aesthetic qualities of life and um you know i i think i think the culture in which we live it is putting pressure on us to think deeply about you know, the, these particular areas of life. And so there is an argument for God from beauty. And um, yes, I was hiking a couple of years ago and I came across a fellow who was with his phone. He was taking a picture of the sun as it was setting. I said, wow, that's beautiful. And it just started off with, I didn't know him from anybody, but you know, I said, why, why do you think human beings are so attracted to beauty? And why, why, why is this something you would want to take a picture? And it, it led to a philosophical discussion of, well, <laughs> could there be beauty in a, in a world without God? And so, you know, the, it's hard to know exactly how to focus on a lot of these issues, but I love to talk about those categories, the, the transcendentals of truth, goodness, and, and beauty. And Again, some people are more concerned with the truth issues. Others, you know, I want to know about the goodness. I don't think we should let go of, of the beauty. I think of Francis Schaeffer. I think of people who talked about, uh, you know, the aesthetic apologetic as well. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's something I love to focus on and I, I love to talk about. And I, and I ask people, look, you know, uh, if you're an evolutionist and you believe nature is the only thing, beauty doesn't seem to give much of a survival advantage. So where did beauty, why is beauty so important? Why is our lives built around it? So yeah, you know, philosophy can be very valuable if it's handled carefully. It and even as you were talking about that, that sunset thing, you know, it made me and of course, you and I share a very uh, a deep love and fondness for C.S. Lewis. And Lewis, I think, was the one who said, uh, "God is a hedonist at heart." And I think uh, I think he says that in uh, Screw Tape Letters, probably. I think, uh, but it, yeah, it, it is. You know, a few years ago, I wrote this article um, called, uh, uh, and I don't remember what it's called. But in the article, I I make the case that why do human beings create art why do we create anything and it's because we are image bearers and we we contain the creative dna of our maker and this is why we take pictures we mold things we chisel things we paint things we draw things we create we take you know we take you know pictures why are we doing that because we're trying to preserve something we're trying to capture a moment of beauty 
And so there seems to be something within us that yearns, this, this is the point you're making, that that yearns for something transcendent, that yearns for something sacred. And even though we live in a time now where we look down, the culture looks down on the sacred, uh, I think the sacred, the transcend, uh, transcendent still appeals um, to the human soul in a subconscious way. I think art, art is doxology. That's what yeah. I think it is. And so, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think, uh, I think maybe, maybe we need to, as theologians and apologists, maybe we need to think about how can we communicate the beauty of the Christian faith in a way that doesn't make it look cold and raw and, you know, and uh, rigid. Uh, so, yes, I, I really think uh, that's, I think you're right. I think you're right about that. Are you familiar with uh, Richard Niebuhr's book back from, I think, back in the 50s, he wrote a book called Christ and Culture. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure. Yes. If, yeah, it's a pretty popular book, very, you know, um, it was it was popular. And I personally think that Niebuhr is, I think he was writing kind of as a liberal Protestant at the time. Uh, but he he offers like this five model, right? These five uh, five models for uh, the, the the intersection between Christianity and culture. And um, now I did I I kind of skimmed over that. I skimmed uh, a lot of what he had written some time ago. And I think D. A. Carson, if I remember correctly, much later wrote a response to his book and mm -hmm. talked about how. Uh, I think he called it Christ and Culture Revisited. I think that was the name of okay. the book that D.A. Carson wrote. But he examines uh, Niebuhr's um, proposals and talks about how, you know, there's there's kind of an element there. There's a lot of nuance there that Niebuhr's missing in his analysis that uh, it doesn't factor in culture. It doesn't factor in the time that we live in. It doesn't factor in the issues that we are dealing with. And I think Carson's uh, I think Carson's treatment of that is very good, and I think um, yeah. it would benefit us as Christians uh, to think more carefully about history, about the about the arts, about culture, and so all these things that you've talked about. Um, we need to have a a holistic, well-rounded uh, sort of um, perspective of the world and again here we go again with i have to be careful sometimes when i quote c.s lewis because you know i almost uh, treat it like uh, like canon sometimes and i have to be careful about that <laughs> but uh you know lewis uh what, what is this very famous quote right that I, I see christianity as a rising sun not yeah. because i see it but because by it i see everything else yeah. and i think that's uh just beautifully eloquently said and how do we you know we need to learn to teach the culture to first show them how beautiful, maybe as you're saying, show them how beautiful the Christian faith is, how beautiful the gospel is, and then bring them around to show them, hey, by the way, it stands on solid ground. This is not only beautiful, but it's true as well. Yeah, I mean, I meet, I, I remember I went to a bookstore a couple of years ago to get a book for my daughter's birthday. And I, I bumped into a couple of people there who like C.S. Lewis, but all they had read is the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> they were not familiar with any of his apologetic writings. And I said, well, have you read this? And no, I, all I know is, you know, these remarkable children's novels. I said, well, you know, there's, there's also Lewis, the literary scholar. There's Lewis, the lay theologian and, and apologist. And they loved Lewis, but they were totally, I didn't know, you know, th there's that fullness. And of course, you know, I agree with you. We can we can disagree with Lewis. We can disagree with Augustine. We can disagree with you know all of these people, but there's something special that they spoke to me at a time that meant a great deal. And so, I always say you know I can critique Lewis, but I don't want anybody else critiquing him because he's he's he he spoke to me at a time when, wow, I really needed guidance and direction in my life. Right. You know, speaking of Lewis and Augustine and all these incredible thinkers of the past, you know, as we come to the end of the um, episode here, um, as as an Indian from the Eastern culture, uh, I was brought up with, uh, with the ethic of you always respect your elders mm. um, because our elders have a lot to offer. Even if they're not Christian, uh, you, they have a lot to offer 
because of their wisdom and you know how long they've been around and it's that you know you you're raised with that sense of respect for your elders in fact i kind of a side note here i remember a long time ago when i first sat in on your class um i actually remember you telling me prashant you don't have to call me you don't have to address me as professor every time you can just call me ken and I remember telling you, I can't do that. I just I can't. That, yeah. I can't do it because it's too deeply ingrained in me to just, you know, I know it's okay here in the West, but from where I'm from, especially a teacher, you give a teacher a lot of respect and you always yeah. address them with uh, with that title. But along those lines, the, the point I'm coming to say is there's a very beautiful old Jewish adage that says, uh, especially for those who are who go into like rabbinical training and things like that, it says, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Mm. And wow. the idea behind that is you want to so closely follow your rabbi in everything he does that you should be covered in his dust. And if you're yeah. covered in the dust that comes off of his slippers, or off of his feet, then that means you've been following him close enough. That's, that's more or less the idea of what they're yeah. trying to communicate. So along those lines... Uh, Professor Samples, as we kind of close up here, we have about five minutes. What can we learn from the past? Um, I was reading a book the other day. It's by uh, Jonathan Hyde. He's a moral psychologist with the uh, University of New York, New York University, I think. He's a secular guy. He's not a religious guy to the best of my not, uh, understanding. But he has a book about, um, you know, the happiness hypothesis is what it's called. And uh, it's the, the premise of the book is what can we moderns learn from ancient wisdom? And now he approaches it from, you know, from a more uh, secular evolutionary kind of perspective, but he does make a lot of reasonable points in there. And so the question that I want to end on is what can we learn both as Christians and as the culture in general, what can we learn from some of the great Christian or non-Christian thinkers of the past, because it seems to me that um, this culture is not interested in ancient wisdom anymore. We are yeah. interested in what we, the, you know, kind of Taylor's poet, poetic uh, view of the world. We're interested in what we make of the world and what, you know, the whatever we believe up here. But I think we're missing out on a great truth and a great boatloads of wisdom there. Yeah. What can we learn from the great Christian or non-Christian thinkers of the past. Yeah, that, you know, Prashant, I think I've really only had one serious time when I had doubts about my faith, where I, I wondered whether I fit. I, I was a young Christian. I was going to kind of a charismatic church. It was, it was, it was intellectual. I remember the pastor even saying, can you think too much? That's your problem. I thought, well, how how could it be thinking be a <laughs> is that problem? possible think too much yeah is that is that too much i i wanted to say well you don't seem to have that problem but i thought no 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 i don't <laughs> say that but you know one of my professors i said you know professor i said at at school we talk about reason at church we talk about faith and i but i'm a man of faith and reason so one of my christian professors said you know can you need to go back to san augustine you know read read anselm and thomas aquinas um there's a great quote by Tony Lane, who taught at um, London University, a Christian school in London. He said, people without uh, knowledge of the past are like people without a memory. Mm. And, you know, I, I think that the ancient world, I agree with you. I mean, the idea that we would call them the church fathers, that these are the doctors of the church, these are the people, and they went through a great deal. I mean, a gun, a gun, at the end of Augustine's life, he lives in late antiquity. You know, he died in four, 430, but in 412, uh, the Roman Empire was coming apart. And, uh, you know, the pagans came into Rome. Uh, there were many ideas that I think were quite similar to our time. I think we can learn a great deal from Christians of the past who've lived through these issues and can right. offer advice to us and can speak to us uh, about these issues. I mean, Prashant, when I read Augustine's Confessions, I think it's one of the great Christian books. I think it's one of the great literary books in the world. That's right. And I often, I often, as I read Augustine, I think he's like an empathetic friend. He's speaking to, he's kind of telling my right. story. Right. You know, the city of God, um, I think of these remarkable yeah. Christians, Athanasius on the incarnation, you know, 
here you have this challenge of Arianism, which is going to divide orthodoxy. I think there's just so many lessons. And, you know, I mean, I think one of the reasons I have become an Anglican is, you know, the Book of Common Prayer, it's, G.I. Packer described it as the Bible arranged for worship, mm. where there is this doxology and there's a depth of theology. And I want that. I need that. And, right. you know, I don't feel alone when I'm reading Augustine. I don't feel alone when I'm reading Athanasius, when I'm reading Pascal. I feel like, wow, these people are speaking to me and challenging me and motivating me. So, I mean, one of my goals as a Christian thinker is to expose people. I wrote a book, Classic Christian Thinkers, where I give an introduction to Irenaeus, Athanasius, Augustine, Anselm Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Pascal, and C.S. Lewis. And I talk about the, the key books that they wrote because I, I, don't, I don't want them just to read my book. I want them to read my book and say, hey, I'm going to try to, I, I'm going to read the Confessions, or I'm going to, I'm going to read Luther's small catechism, or I'm going to read Irenaeus. It is that wisdom of the past. It, it, it's not that they were perfect. They made mistakes. Church history has a dark side, but man, it's just packed with, with wisdom. And they had an appreciation for Plato and for Aristotle and Stoicism, and yet they also brought a Christian critique. And so I think a classical Christianity to me is deeply rich, uh, deeply attractive, and I, I think uh, I think it could help us to deal with a lot of challenges we have today. That's wonderful, Professor Samples. Thank you so much for making yourself available to join us. It's been, you know, every, every time I talk to you, it uh, it feels like um, again, like I said at the top of this segment, I don't remember the last time. You and I talked, yeah. it's probably been a couple of years, but when I do talk to you, it feels like we just picked up from where we left off and it doesn't seem <laughs> like right. a lot of time has passed. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming and uh, just sharing your wisdom with us. And uh, I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I want to, I want to tell your audience that, you know, you are, you, the Lord has given you many gifts for Sean. And I want to, I want to encourage your listeners to support you, uh, to, to come to your conferences. You have so much to offer, and I'm very proud of you. you uh, oh, let me say you. that again. As a student at Biola, you, you just had this, I thought, very attractive balance between a life of the mind, but also you were very passionate about your love for your wife, caring for your kids, and I thought, I love that. So it's my it's always a privilege to talk with you and thank you for inviting me on your program thank you so much thank you so much for those kind words it means a lot it means a lot to me i appreciate it very very much